Welcome to our fluid seminar today. Uh, I have uh, the pleasure of introducing uh, uh, Johan de Gui of uh, Lincey. Oh, sorry, Listen. Um, so, uh, Johan, uh, he received uh, his PhD in 2004 uh, from Eco Centrale de Lyon. Uh, after that, uh, he went to the uh, Department of Mathematics in the University of Bristol as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, and then also joined the KTH uh, in the mechanics department, again for a period uh, of a few a couple of years as a postdoc. Uh, then he was um, recruited as a CNRS uh, researcher uh, in uh, Lipsy, Orsay, uh, and uh, um, 2009, uh, uh, which is now Lisan CNRS. Uh, so he's going to talk to us about oblique laminar turbulent interfaces in plain channel flows. And uh, please, you have to okay. Well, thank you very much, Tarane, for, for the invitation. So if you don't mind, I'll speak in English. Uh, I can answer any question in French, uh, uh, of course. Um, OK, so thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to give a real talk. It's been, uh, I, mean, I, don't, I can't remember when I, I last gave a, a seminar talk, apart from my uh, habilitation last year. But um, so it's a bit strange for me. <laughs> I have to remember how to do it. OK, so I'd like to present some old and more recent work uh, done recently at, uh, at Listen and Everywhere. Um, the work has been done uh, in collaboration with Pavan Kashyap, who uh, recently defended a PhD at Listen, precisely, uh, end of December last year. Uh, together with uh, Olivier Dochot at ESPCI. And part of the work that I'll present has been also done in collaboration with, um, well, so-called Austrians. Uh, so in Kloster Neuburg, the, the team of Björnhof uh, with PhD student Chaitanya and, uh, and postdoc Mukund. So the, the general topic is one of my favorite ones, is transition to turbulence in wall bonded shear flows. Uh, so as you know, in any pipe or channel, you can have a laminar flow. Uh, for instance, here, it is believed to, be, to look laminar. And for higher flow rate, you get turbulent flow. And uh, needless to tell you, but um, turbulence energetically is not favorable at all. If you want to achieve the same flow rate uh, in a turbulent regime, you need to pump much more. And at equivalent uh, energy spending, when it's turbulent, you get definitely less flow rate than when it's laminar. Uh, so we, it's important to, to understand how you go from one, um, one regime to the next. And there's a classical recipe for that, which I try to sum up in, uh, in one slide, uh, is the usual stability analysis. Uh, when you consider first the laminar flow solution and you want to know how you depart from it in time, so dynamically. So you study that solution, which is a nonlinear solution of the Navier-Stokes equations. You check for its linear stability. You identify then the values of the Reynolds numbers at which it is linearly unstable. So here in that sketch, this is when you leave the, uh, the stability region and you go to another flow state. Uh, now, this bifurcated flow state, again, you can study its linear stability and see when you depart from it. And after a cascade of bifurcations, you hope that you find broadband chaos, which is interpreted as turbulence. So that's a recipe. It gets more and more technical as you climb up the ladder. Um, but does that work? For many cases, it does work. Uh, let's take the usual uh, textbook example of rayleigh benard convection. That uh, works in the sense that it, able, it, um, it leads to actual predictions. For the teloquet uh, flow, so between two rotating cylinders, uh, in general it works, depends on the parameter range. But for um, proper shear flow such as pipe flow, planquet flow, for instance, this is a total failure. Uh, linear stability analysis doesn't predict any Reynolds number where the base flow is unstable. Uh, so it's of no use. And now for, so I would like to focus on plain Poiseuille flow in that, um, in, in this, in the present talk. 
Uh, and here, as well as for the Blasius boundary layer, yes, it works in the sense that linear stability analysis predicts something, but as we will see, it's kind of misleading for the question we will ask. So let me show that ge geometry I want to focus on is very simple. Uh, two walls. Uh, that's upstream, there's a higher pressure than downstream, and that creates a flow. Uh, and of course, we will consider this setup in three dimensions. So x will be the streamwise direction, uh, z the spanwise one, and y is the wall normal direction. Uh, you all know that if you solve for a laminar solution, uh, so a steady one, you get a parabolic profile. It's the general stability of that uh, profile we want to investigate. So uh, if I define the Reynolds number based on the center line velocity, as you know, for a value of 5772 something, uh, there is a critical Reynolds number above which some perturbations are unstable. If I look at a channel from above and streamwise, I mean the, the flow goes from left to right, the Laminar, this is valid as well for, for Blasius boundary layers. If you increase the Reynolds number, the first mode that gets destabilized looks like spinewise rollers. So that means it's invariant with respect to the, the spinewise direction. And they undergo a, a three dimensional distortion that leads to complicated uh, structures that are no longer spinewise invariant that generate spots. And then, uh, and then turbulence. OK, that's, that's the story. And yeah, until the 60s, 70s, a lot of people were happy with this. And that can be observed experimentally. But other things can be observed experimentally, namely that at m quite lower values of the Reynolds number, for instance, here 1,000, in the experiment, this also goes from left to right, if you perturb the flow strong enough, you can get something that is interpreted as turbulence. So these are experimental pictures. Uh, you see that, that this is much below the, uh, the linear stability threshold. If you could look in detail at the, the turbulent flow, you see that it's dominated by streaks uh, that, so structures that are in invariant with respect to the streamwise direction, not the spanwise one. So if I use some finite amplitude solutions that were computed elsewhere, uh, this is the contradiction. The eigenmodes that uh, provoke instability are spanwise rollers. So if this is streamwise, spanwise, it, they have this orientation. Whereas the structures that you observe in turbulence they have this symmetry, so they're invariant with respect to the streamwise direction, and they break the, the spanwise invariance. So eigenmodes resolve. So that tells us that these, these structures are perhaps not the, the most immediate way of, of investigating the dynamics of the turbulent flow itself. You, what I mean is that you don't need to understand how these structures grow to understand why these kind of structures sustains itself. That's the main idea um, I want to, uh, to show here. So that leads to a uh, suggestion for a change of paradigm. If you want to, to study the, the, the turbulent state itself, the idea is that we should perhaps not focus on the route from laminar to turbulence if you want to, to predict the turbulent state itself. Uh, the main reason is the subcriticality. Uh, if you know that a given perturbation grows and saturates, it doesn't mean that you know how low in Reynolds number you can uh, go to sustain turbulent flow. So the idea that was promoted by F Fabian Wallef was that we, we should rather look at the existence of a turbulent state itself and then go, go down in Reynolds number until that turbulent state dies out. And that would tell us at which low uh, Reynolds number the, the, turb the turbulence star starts to exist. And the route from laminar to turbulence is perhaps secondary in this, uh, in this point of view. So that suggests actually a, 
a, a method to study the turbulent state is to first reach the turbulent state and then adiabatically reduce the Reynolds number until we get the extinction. That way, we would perhaps, hopefully, get to the simplest turbulent state that can be there. Uh, and this is what we want to study today. So these are the main questions that I summed up here. What is the simplest form of turbulence that can exist uh, in, the, in these flows? Hoping that it's simple enough to be understandable. Uh, and at which values of the Reynolds number can it be found? So there's a short uh, answer for this question. What is the simplest form of, tur of turbulence in, in wall bounded shear flow that you can get? So let's start with pipe flow, because it's the Reynolds uh, celebrated example. Turbulence close to the onset is localized. So this is uh, the flow is from left to right. And you get here in experiments, as well as in numerics, a localization of turbulent state. So this is called a turbulent path. Uh, if you focus on uh, specially extended flows, uh, so with the two-dimensional extent rather than the one-dimensional extent of a pipe, uh, you also get localization of turbulence depending on the regime, so it's, it can be tricky to go into the details. So this is the teloquet flow in the counter-rotating regime. This is planquet flow, so it's experimental pictures. I hope you can see something. So you see that there's an alternation here of laminar and turbulent flows, uh, a structured one. So you see some kind of patterning with um, apparent wavelength. Uh, here, this is a torsional so a quad flow, so it's a rotor stator, essentially. And the, the black zones are laminar, and as here. Uh, and black is, uh, uh, sorry, black is laminar, and grayish is, uh, is turbulent. These are other structures that we found in simulations uh, of an annular quad flow, so yet another geometry. Um, OK. So uh, I need to introduce parameters a bit more accurately. So um, I will play with two different length scales. So, so say one is the length scale that people from instability use. The other is the one that people from turbulence use. So one obvious length scale, if you're in a channel geometry, is the, the gap between the plates. So here, h is the half gap. So we call that outer units because it defines the geometry. Another one is uh, related to, so it's, there's another length scale that actually ignores the geometry. Uh, it's a one that you can construct by noting that if you impose a pressure gradient, you impose the shear uh, at the wall in average. And from the shear at the wall, just by dimensional an analysis, you can define a friction velocity. Uh, and using the, the um, kinematic viscosity, by dividing nu by the, this friction velocity, you define uh, an inner unit, uh, which we call delta nu here, which it completely ignores the fact that there's a wall somewhere up there. So two different uh, length scales in that problem. And now, by dividing one by the other, you define uh, a fric so-called friction Reynolds number that actually measures the ratio between the largest scales of the flow in, in the wall normal direction and the smallest ones. Uh, so delta nu plays the role of, uh, of Kolmogorov length, if, if you want, uh, in non-isotropic way. And so that's uh, friction Reynolds number is the one that turbulent people like to, to use. Uh, whereas in the literature, you will often use, uh, see that people use another definition of the Reynolds number based on the same uh, length scale and kinematic viscosity, but another velocity scale uh, that experimentalists can control. Uh, in the laminar regime, you can, get a, you can convert one into the other. Okay. So uh, before I started to work on that subject, we observed that um, well, uh, there, there were other simulations, namely uh, uh, Takahiro Tsukara in, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, had the idea of considering rather large numerical domains. So here, this is streamwise, fanwise, 
And uh, what is visualized here is, is uh, actually uh, streamwise velocity fluctuations. It started from this, this featureless turbulence regime and started to decrease the, the Reynolds number, either Reynolds 2 or Reynolds CL, as you want. And uh, around, yeah, between 150 for Reynolds 2, you could find a structure, strange structure, structuration sorry, of the turbulent flow in two bands. So rather loose oblique bands oblique with respect to the streamwise direction. And that was confirmed later in other uh, numerical simulations. Uh, this looks analog to what is observed in plane quiet flow. Uh, but if you go into details, there are differences. OK, so now I would like to use the numerical tools in a constructive way to try to analyze, OK, what can we learn about this, this turbulent flow? knowing that we should hopefully get this kind of animals uh, if we work in large enough domains. Well, let's start with small periodic computational domains. Why? Because they're not so costly. You can nowadays run this uh, on, on a computer, um, and also because of their historical uh, interest. So, so it started with the concept of um, minimal flow unit, which is very popular uh, in, in turbulent studies. It was introduced by Jimenez and Moin. Uh, the idea was to play uh, with the um, periodic boundary condition of the domain. Uh, so rather than complaining about the periodic boundary condition, we want to use them in a clever way. Here, the idea was to focus on the near wall structures and get rid of the larger structures of the turbulence. So by doing this, here, these are, this, this are the spanwise uh, dimension of the domain. They could note that they could sustain turbulence as low as, uh, for boxes with a spanwise extent, as low as 100 uh, inner units. But if they reduce to a smaller size, uh, turbulence was definitely uh, short-lived and, and would not sustain. If you consider this kind of, uh, of domains, you get a very simple uh, dynamic. So here, these are vorticity, li vorticity lines. It's almost a limit cycle. It's a bit chaotic. Uh, but more problematically, the turbulence you get is lives on one wall only. So it's a very, very minimal uh, version of the turbulent flow. Uh, so it can be useful also to understand the dy dynamics of streaks and streamwise vortices. But it doesn't look like what we see in, uh, in experiments when we lower the Reynolds number. Definitely not. There's a little problem. There's also another characteristic that is not really a problem. So here, this is energy versus time. Then different Reynolds numbers is that the, when you play with such minimal uh, dimensions, you get some turbulent signal, and then it dies after a finite time. And it always ends up dying. So this turbulence is actually only transient. And OK, we have doubts whether this is realistic. So playing with periodic domains that are too small leads to unrealistic results. This is important to, uh, to realize. Namely, uh, mainly because one would be tempted to first play with uh, small periodic domains. Um, OK. Now, what has been uh, attempted by other people, uh, especially uh, Loretta Kaman and, and Dwight Barclay, uh, and Sebastian Gomez, who sits down here. Thank you for coming. Um, the idea was that if at the lowest Reynolds number where turbulence can be found, there is localization, maybe the minimal computational domains that need to be considered should respect this property of uh, spatial lo localization. Besides, uh, this localization turns out to uh, favor oblique patterns. So maybe we should consider periodic computational domains that also respect this obliqueness. So this is what has been done by simply considering the, the, the domain minimal in one direction, but extended in the other. 
and tilted in a way that it, um, it aligns with the natural direction of the turbulent stripes, which we know from experimental measurements or larger numerics. So this is what has been done. Uh, this is slightly more costly, but it's okay. Uh, it's still manageable. So this um, here, this now these are uh, space-time diagrams. So now Z is the um, is the long direction. Uh, so you see the onset of of patterning. So this is space and time. So. Uh, this as the Reynolds number is decreased, uh, first you see something we would like to call featureless. Uh, as you start to decrease the Reynolds number, you start to see these bands appearing again. But now this not, uh, beware, this is not space and space, this is space and time. So you only see here the propagation of, of a localized periodic pattern. Okay? with a speed of propagation that varies as you change the Reynolds number. This is an, uh, plotted in a mov moving frame. And below some Reynolds number, you start to uh, observe that turbulence is also transient, as was found in the smaller boxes too. So maybe that property still contains something physical. Okay? And below some Reynolds number, it it's became, becomes really short-lived. So uh, the statistics of the time it takes for relaminarization has been uh, investigated uh, here by Sebastian in the, um, uh, uh, depending on the Reynolds number. So interestingly, these times for relaminarization are distributed in an exponential way, uh, which means it's a memory-less decay, uh, which means that these turbulent stripes can die more or less at any time. Uh, okay, now it can die, but because there is in enough space, it can also grow and proliferate. Uh, so from one localized object, you get two. And the time, the, the proper uh, mm, distribution of the time it takes to proliferate has also been measured, and this is also exponential. Now if you consider the mean time it takes to decay and the mean time it takes to proliferate, uh, you see that the first, the former increases with the Reynolds number, the latter decreases, so they have to cross. And they cross around a Reynolds number here of 1000 in this definition. The idea is that below this, this critical uh, value, everything will decay eventually, whereas above it will proliferate. So it's a bit more realistic. Um, we still wonder, okay, but if we go down in Reynolds number, still this turbulence before it dies, you know, what does it look like? So um, this is in the in the PhD of uh, of Chai Paranjape. Uh, we consider here this domain. So this is uh, so it's tilted. You have to think, tilt your head. Uh, and here is the Reynolds number. And what we did is simply decrease the Reynolds number pseudo adiapatically. Uh, so here you you see in a chaotic way, this, this tricks. So this is streamwise velocity. So blue and red means um, low and high. And as you go down be below 500, so this, at this Reynolds number, turbulence is definitely transient. But we turn the Reynolds number down fast enough to, to avoid that. And interestingly, we managed to find, without any Newton um, solver, nothing, a stable state that is periodic in time. So, and it consists of streaks. So it's a simple array of streaks with some periodicity. So here is the per perturbation energy. And as we decrease, 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 here is a transient chaos, but we tunnel through it, and we manage to, to, to stabilize invariant solutions. Uh, in the, in the uh, shape of a periodic orbit. So that's the simplest manifestation of the turbulence we, we could see. So just for the little story, then it loses stability, and we see that it bifurcates off a, a brain here, a family of traveling wave solutions that are unstable, that we had, have found actually somewhere else in another publication. And for many angles, we could find these, these branches of solutions that are finite amplitude and are disconnected from the laminar state. 
and we could track them down to less than 400 in Reynolds number. That's quite substantially lower than the, uh, what had been found, for instance, by, uh, by Sebastian. So, and if, what is interesting is to consider now this, this lowest example of turbulence as a laboratory to understand the turbulent flow. So it's a very simple, Simplified version of the turbulent flow, but still solution of the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, so there was the uh, Wallef suggested actually in the 90s uh, a mechanism to explain the, the near world uh, turbulence. So it's a cyclic process that involves streamwise vortices that feed streaks, and the streaks wiggle, get unstable, and that generates vorticity that feeds back into the streamwise vortices. So we have actually an illustrate with these finite amplitude solutions, which are equilibria of the Navier-Stokes solutions. We have actually an illustration of that mechanism. Here we represent the streamwise vorticity, so you see the streaks. Uh, and here for some solutions you see that they have wiggle. So that's the, the x-dependent part. I didn't plot the streamwise vortices, but they are, they are there. It would be messy to, to show everything, but they are definitely there. What is not included in this picture is the localization. And I, just a small remark is that for some of the solutions, for instance in here, uh, there we don't see any x dependence. So maybe it goes beyond the Wallace picture, and maybe the localization actually plays another role that man managed to maintain the state uh, against viscous decay without the need for uh, a streak instability. Okay, this is just a remark. Okay. Um, I will move to the last part. But okay, and finally, I do the real thing, which means I move to the larger spatial domains. Um, so this, this we did only recently. Uh, the credible experiments are also, uh, strangely enough, quite recent uh, for this low, low Reynolds number regime. So um, it's only a few years ago uh, with the colleagues in Austria that, uh, that we managed to, to actually see those turbulent stripes. Uh, but you, you need a very long channel to, to be able to observe them, and it's very difficult to have a thin channel of, uh, here it's five or six meters long, uh, and keeping the parallelism all along that distance is, is definitely difficult. So as you can see, turbulent strikes have been observed in, uh, in, in, in experiments, and um, it was found by them that above some Reynolds number, they have a tendency to grow, whereas below they have a tendency to retract. This could not be studied in the periodic domains that I previously showed. Uh, interestingly, the, the critical point is was pretty well evaluated before. Uh, observation uh, here, e puzzling one, is that the t time it takes for laminarization is this is in this in red here, compared to all the other uh, flows like pipe flow, etc. Here the distributions are not exponential, so the decay is not memoryless. So it all de it's all dependent on the experimental conditions. Now I move to the direct numerical simulations that uh, that that we did very recently. So it's the work of of Pavian Ka Pavan Kashyap. So to have to play with large enough domains, we have to to reach yeah, a streamwise extent of 500 and spi spinewise of extent of uh, of 250. So we use the the channel flow code that is spectral and, and fully parallel, uh, fully MPI. Now this is open uh, open access, so you can play with it tomorrow. Uh, need uh, some computing hours, perhaps. So, and we took a resolution which is locally comparable to any uh, very turbulent uh, simulation. So here in these movies, this is X, sorry, X and Z. I will display the, uh, the streamwise, uh, streamwise velocity. And uh, so I, this is at Reynolds 200. 
and you see nothing in particular. Uh, at 90, if you have a trained eye, you might see some pattern in here. But do not watch for too long, okay, please. <laughs> Uh, if you go down, keep on going down in Reynolds number, always taking the last uh, state of the last simulation <laughs> as an initial condition for the new one, you see that now clearly you can call this laminar turbulent pattern. The green parts are laminar with very few fluctuations, and this is wildly turbulent locally. Uh, if you go down to 55, this it, turbulence becomes sparser and sparser. So the, the size of the turbulent patches does not change a lot, but it's the laminar patches that grow larger. Uh, it stays the same all the way, but below 50, something else happened that we don't fully understand at the moment, is that the, the pattern doesn't stay steady anymore. Sorry, it was in a moving frame. But now in any frame you might choose, you see differential velocity between the stripes. So they, they have a head now, and they start to travel and get collisions. So if you wanted to consider the previous regimes as a solid, now this is a gas. Uh, and below 39, we get this, and we didn't go below, because we noted that we, every time we need a larger domain, at some point it becomes really too costly. So what, we, what I would like to explain today, uh, among many things, is the, the upper uh, threshold, so what happens between this and that. You know? So the common belief is that uh, laminar turbulent patterns emerge through the nucleation, uh, in a thermodynamic sense, of a, a, a laminar patch. And what we found out is that this was not really true. Uh, so here, just by me measuring the, the energy from the, 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 the spectra, we could kind of define an amplitude of these modulated patterns. And as you can see, they start to grow continuously out of the, um, of the zero level, which we expect for, for, for um, the turbulent state. So what, uh, what we did is um, actually to run many simulations for, per, for each Reynolds number and perturb the, the, turbulent, the turbulent state, the patternless turbulent state, and for each wave number, measure decay. So if you do that, you don't see an exponential decay. But after, if you do that 40 times for each uh, Reynolds number, the average, uh, so this is still the same, the amplitude as defined before, uh, you see that there, in, in average, there's something like a, an exponential decay. Uh, but the averaging, I insist on it, it's important. So we simply fitted for every kx and kz uh, a decay. So that leads us to uh, the numerical equivalent of an average dispersion relation. So here is the, the, the decay, sorry, yeah, well, the growth rate, uh, opposite of the decay rate as a function of the kx here, so the streamwise wave number, uh, parameterized by the Reynolds number here. As you could see, uh, for high Reynolds number, every, all the sigmas sorry, are, are negative. And when you pass uh, below 95, suddenly you, you start to see positive decay. So as a regular instability, but for the turbulent flow. So we need the averaging here. And that gives us a streamwise, uh, uh, so sorry, that's the case. It's not streamwise, it's absolute uh, critical wavelength of 36H, so still large scale. And as for the, uh, so now this is the same, but sigma versus Reynolds tau for different case. Uh, and you, you could see that it, it's roughly at Reynolds tau 95 that we get this instability of the turbulent flow, uh, which corresponds to 4,500. If we go a bit beyond that, uh, so what have we shown here? We, we just showed that the patterning can be seen as a linear instability of a turbulent flow. Uh, it's not obvious. Uh, if you plug the turbulent mean flow into the Orsommerfeld equations, 
you do not get this instability. Uh, you would actually the square theorem would predict Reynolds, that it would be unstable for Reynolds number, oh, sorry, larger than a critical Reynolds number. Whereas here it occurs for Reynolds below a certain threshold. Um, so you see that it was not obvious to find the, the, the right theory. We would like to go beyond, but here I'm, I'm starting to be a bit uh, speculative. Uh, can we give a name to this instability? So we have an instability of a homogeneous turbulent flow. Um, among the many candidates, can, can it be interpreted as a Turing instability? So the Turing instability is an instability that also breaks the, the homogeneity. It's a patterning instability that is found, what, what was found by Turing, in the context of a, a coupled system of reaction diffusion equations, namely with two species, and it's due to the difference between the diffusivities. Uh, it's believed to explain uh, a lot of patterns that are found in biological contexts. Uh, here, for instance, uh, tiger stripes, or zebra stripes, or seashells. Um, you have to keep in mind that pro these systems are very noisy, so this is a really b a low level modeling. Uh, so I insist on the difference of the diffusivities. Uh, which means that if you have these two species and their concentration and a perturbation breaking the homogeneity, the fact that one diffuses fast, uh, further than the, the other, namely the inhibitor, helps the, um, the, sorry, the instability to spread uh, spatially. It's this same mechanism is also thought to be to be active not only for zebra stripes, but tiger stripes, but also, for instance, for the problem of vegetation patterns. Uh, in this is also contained in mathematical model, uh, and as the the, the precipitation, uh, so the the, amount, the rainfall uh, changes, it's believed that for lower and lower level of precipitation, you go towards desertification. So for me, it's the same problem as what we studied before in the turbulence case. So uh, it means that we need to uh, in an interpretation. So two species interacting, it's not very easy. Uh, how do they diffuse one into each other? Just naively, laminar flow has a diffusivity of mu. That's the definition of, of, of the, the viscosity. The turbulent flow has another diffusivity, so in principle should diffuse more. Uh, but if you write these diffusivities as the product of a uh, velocity scale u tau, precisely, and a length scale, uh, the nice thing is that the condition for Turing instability, namely that the ratio of diffusivity goes that way, implies, well, simply this, which is equivalent to Reynolds tau lower than a given threshold. And um, so we're quite happy about this because, again, as I said, if you consider the Orr-Sommerfeld approach, you wouldn't get this, uh, this, this threshold. And this is consistent with the, the, the current observation. So perhaps it should, uh, the Turing instability is a, is a nice explanation. Uh, I have two, three minutes more. OK. So, um, I'd like to compare this to a rule of thumb that is not so well known. Uh, it's, uh, so it's one that it has been frequently used by Alfred Son and Matsubara, so uh, for, for turbulent people, if you want, uh, to say, OK, can we say something simple about when turbulence exists between two walls? The two walls are separated by a, a size of 2h in the wall normal direction. And you want to fit structures which, which have a width of, if you can see in green, 100 uh, inner units. Assuming that those structures are roughly cir circular, you need to have 100 inner units fitting 2h. So for this, 2h has to be larger than 200 inner units, which means that the ratio h by delta nu, which is exactly Reynolds tau, has to be larger than 50. Uh, that's a rule of thumb. You see, it's very simple. And we got here two, two thresholds for turbulence, one at 95, the other at 49. So this is a pretty good rule of thumb, after all. 
So PT is not more used. Um, so that's one thing. And the other one is even simpler. Uh, it turns out n almost nobody had noticed it. If you divide Reynolds two by uh, the usual bulk defined Reynolds number, you square it, you get the friction factor CF, which you find in any textbook for a Moody diagram. Uh, it measures the efficiency of the, the turbulent flow, if you want. Now, that's the laminar branch. That's the turbulent one. And the patterns are found exactly here. And this is very close to 0 0.01. So that leads us to uh, a number, a non-dimensional number, CF equal 1%, characteristic of the, the laminar turbulent patterns. If you compare, believe me, all the other <laughs> shear flows that we know that develop uh, large-scale patterns, they all have CF equal 0 0.01. So it seems like this is a magic number that people have been ignoring for a century. That defines, actually, the, the range of existence of those laminar turbulent bends or puffs, also in pipe flow. Uh, and um, my question is for you, why? That's an observation, but um, you know, it lacks a theory now. OK, so now time for conclusions. So one of the conclusions is simply uh, that, OK, Thanks to the numerics, we have a, 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 a bifurcation diagram for, for channel flow. So it's a turbulence, transitional uh, bands here. Okay. So more evidence of it. But you see, it's only recent evidence for, for this. And that the um, existence of these turbulent laminar patterns actually comes from a special modulation of the turbulent flow. Uh, not from some kind of uh, nucleation uh, phenomenon. Uh, so the instability framework is relevant at the condition that you consider that it's the instability of the turbulent flow, and you need averaging for it to, to be solid. Uh, now about the outlook, so we could obviously go, go beyond that. We did more, but... Uh, I want you to stick within the load time. So there's a second transition at lower Reynolds number from static bands to moving ones. Uh, and it's still a bit mysterious. Uh, in Pavan's thesis, there are some new elements we can discuss if you want. Uh, there's another part that I didn't talk at all about is uh, what about the full extinction of the turbulent state? When does that occur and in which con conditions? So there are many recent, or not so recent, uh, suggestions that it follows a process of directed percolations. percolation. It's not completely accepted, especially for the, the, the case of plan channel flow. It's probably not universal. Uh, OK. And then, OK, can we understand more about the simple rules of thumb, thumb that I showed uh, at the end? And with this, I'd like to thank you. And I welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Johan, uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, if there are any questions, we open the floor. I know I, I arrived very, very late, but just in case you didn't talk about this earlier, in the talk, can you say a few more words about directed percolation? Uh, a few more words, yes. Uh, so here is the um, is the bifurcation diagram that you know we we fill it up every time we 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 find something in the simulations. So the question is about here, you know. When you go, so if you track the, down the turbulent state all the way to extinction, uh, how does it scale here? How does the turbulent fraction scale near the onset? And it's very difficult. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to investigate because you need huge spatial scales and huge time scales. So there were many errors in the past. So the, the directed percolation was suggested in a rather loose way by Pomo in 86 as, okay, something that should be found. 
40 years ago or uh, later, there is evidence that in a plane coit flow, the, the turbulent fraction obeys a direct percolation scaling close to the, the onset. In pipe flow, it's not yet clear, but probably. And in plane Poiseuille flow, sorry, I didn't bring the data. It looks like it's following something else. But uh, again, the, the numerics doesn't allow to check this. And uh, same for the, the experiments. Do you want me to explain what directed percolation is, or no, it's more difficult? To give your feeling about the connection to directed percolation and the position of the turbulence, and you have perfectly answered the question. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> I had one question there, Johan. Yes. Uh, when you were looking at the structures, uh, especially when you're getting closer to the limit cycle, mm? type of uh, the periodic uh, uh, cycle, mm? um, I was wondering if, I think you hinted at it, if there is any connection with the resolvent analysis that they do in, with the structures that they get with the resolvent analysis that they do at Caltech, uh, when they look at uh, the, uh, the instability of the mean base flow for the turbulence. Um, so, do you mean when I, I was uh, going down in Reynolds number? Yeah, when you are sorry. looking at the minimum units and you you see the structure. Yeah, exactly that. This one. Uh, uh, and later, uh, two more slides, I think. Uh, one more. Ah, yeah, the, sorry. This one. These structures that yes. you see. Is there any connection with the ones that they see with the resolvent? Uh, so, as far as I know, the, the work done at Caltech, it's it's at higher Reynolds number, and there is no localization. I see. Um, so um, no, I don't manage to see to see a connection, but I hope I um, I have in mind the right papers. So yeah, yeah, no, mm. no, there's such so higher le Reynolds um, number. Here, my focus is really on the fact that okay, you can stabilize uh, an array of streaks, but this is uh, an, any mm. channel flow simulation. You will get streaks and streamwise vortices. Mm -hmm. It's not so hard. Uh, here is the localization and the fact that there's a simple dynamics in time. Mm -hmm. that this is what I focus on. So yeah, I didn't I see that in Caltech's work. No, uh, no. I, I was just wondering if there is any connection, especially for modeling. If the structures are the same, then you can, uh, even in the small units and then in the large turbulence with large Lenormand number, then you, maybe you can use these structures for, uh, for wall modeling purposes. I don't know. I, don't, I know that the... So there, are, there, there is um, a corresponding non-localized structure associated with it. Mm -hmm. And what I know from the work of Sharma, for instance, is that by going to, the, the, to studying the resolvent operator, they could reconstruct such structures. Mm -hmm. I didn't fully understand why, I have to admit. <laughs> uh, but they could see a link between these non-linear solutions and the resolvent <laughs> operator. Right. Uh, but I don't know where to make the lo uh, spatial localization appear in this uh, yeah, in this uh, formalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you put your last diagram about the bifurcation uh, in your conclusions, uh, the global picture in the Reynolds number? Yes, this one. Yes. I was wondering, um, when you speak about um, uh, the equilibrium between, um, you know, the, for the puffs, between the, the decay time and mm -hmm. uh, the uh, proliferation time, time, yes, yeah. okay. Uh, wha this gives one specific Reynolds number. Mm. Ha where is it here and is it oh, it's this one? Yeah, it has to be here. Okay, so it's... Uh, Any more questions? Well, thank you, Johan. Merci. <laughs>